Masad Ayub is recognized worldwide as an expert in the use of firearms for self-defense and law enforcement applications. He is the author of several books and hundreds of magazine articles dealing with the use of lethal force. He is a firearms tactics instructor for law enforcement and civilians and the founder of LFI, the Lethal Force Institute. As a champion pistol competitor, Masad Ayub has been a member of several all-state and state champion handgun teams in both bullseye and combat style shooting. And he is an expert witness who appears in the defense of police officers involved in shootings. To say the least, Masad Ayub is uniquely qualified to present the material you are about to see. Masad, I guess the, uh, the first thing we should talk about is your experience and some of the things that you've done over the course of time to give you a status as not only an expert witness but also a, uh, a renowned writer uh, when it comes to police shooting situations. Well, in my case, it's been training and research, uh, both of which began fairly early. I was the <clears throat> only son of an immigrant jeweler who had survived one armed robbery murder attempt and had used deadly force in self-defense. Uh, part of my training from very early in my childhood was weapons, uh, the how as well as the when. Uh, because of an anomaly of law in the state where we grew up, it was in fact legal for me to carry a loaded weapon concealed inside the privately owned place of business without a permit, and I did so from about the age of 12. Uh, my dad knew a lot of the local cops, lawyers, and judges. I would be sitting around when he picked their brains, and eventually the time came when I started picking their brains. I knew the, the degree of responsibility that came with that. You know, waking up in the morning and you're a 12-year-old kid with a loaded pistol in a, in a high-risk retail store. And I started reading everything I could find, which back then wasn't much. Uh, you had McGivern on fast and fancy revolver shooting, uh, the Stuart Lake biography of Wyatt Earp. And you, you could get a pretty good handle on how to do it, but nothing ever said when to do it. And in talking with the cops and the lawyers, and finding out just how many trick bags there were, and just, just how many of the things you would hear at the gun shop were 180 degrees from reality. I started studying, and they showed me how to do it in the legal libraries. And what I found there frightened me even more. Uh, that became the genesis of the book, In the Gravest Extreme. Uh, in the meantime, in the early 70s, I had begun doing a lot of work in police journalism and firearms journalism, uh, first published in 71. From probably 70, I would say 73 to 1980, I worked uh, full time as a uh, journalist emphasis, with emphasis on the law enforcement sector. Uh, this put me in constant contact first with police officers who had been in violent encounters, who I would intensively debrief because they were the subject of a story. Second, <clears throat> because those magazines wanted lots of articles and the best available training. The only way for me to analyze the training was to go and take the training. So once I had done the article, there was one more training certificate and one more training experience in my own background. Uh, at about that same time, 1972, I had uh, gotten into part-time law enforcement and had come this close to, to doing it for a career. It was just that I felt I could make more money and learn a lot more and do a lot more good uh, going around the country, picking up the, the things that I was picking up. In 1981, I did the, uh, the prototype course for LFI with Ray Chapman at Chapman Academy, uh, the Armed Citizens Program. Prior to that, I had been uh, Chief Firearms Instructor for a Defensive Tactics Institute under John Peters. And at uh, Chapman's urging, in October of 1981, I founded Lethal Force Institute. I had figured I'd you know, teach a class a month or something, and uh, it would be kind of fun. And the next thing I knew, that had become the tail that wagged the dog. I've since become full-time instructor, part-time writer, and still part-time police officer. And somewhere along the line in the late 1970s, I started getting requests to appear as an expert witness for civilians and police who were charged with excessive force or wrongful death and self-defense incidents. At the present time, 
that's probably 5% of the income and 30% of the work at any given time. Uh, I'll take probably 20 cases a year, a uh, few of which actually go to trial. I'll only take a clean case, and by definition, the clean ones you know, settle or are dropped. Mm -hmm. uh, the only ones that go to trial seem to be the, the ones that are politically motivated or greed motivated or a terrible mistake was made somewhere in the system. Uh, during that period, I also became uh, what's known as a police prosecutor. In my state, we have a program in which someone who has not been to law school but is designated by their agency can get a short period of training and be the prosecutor for the state in violations and misdemeanors. Mm -hmm. And I've been doing that for a couple of years on the side as well. Well, you've uh, written about tens of shooting incidents and probably have researched hundreds. Well, well under the hundreds. Uh, what have you learned from those? Is there a, well, first, let me ask you, are there any statistics that are involved in, in the average gunfight, quote-unquote, average? No, whenever you hear uh, the average uh, was this number of shots or that distance, bear in mind there is no central empirical database that's determining every armed encounter. Uh, you do have that in New York City and have had since 1970, the SLP-9 studies. Uh, standard operating procedure number nine was the intensive debriefing of every officer involved in an armed encounter with questions like how many shots were fired, did you use your sights, what position were you in, did you fire one-handed or two. That seems to be fairly unique to New York. We have now the Dick Fairburn study that's ongoing that will gather a lot of data. But at the present time, nationwide, the only real source that we have is uh, the officer's killed summary. And certainly there are valid things to learn from there. But if, if the men who lost the fight were firing 2.3 rounds, do we want to train our officers to expect to fire 2.3 rounds to win, given the fact that some of those men fired 2.3 rounds on the average when they died at the first shot and were never able to respond, when the gun that killed them was their own and they had nothing to fight back with. I would say nationwide it's probably going closer to five or six rounds per participant. And the reason it's not going more is because not everyone has semi-automatics yet. Uh, I see a number of cases where the guns are emptied, sometimes reloaded and emptied again multiple times. Uh, the last three I've gone to uh, court on was one shot, one hit, one neutralization. But you, you just can't really draw a trend on that. Uh, you can get a, a good idea of what cartridges and what guns work and what guns don't. You'll find that th there are certain trends. Typically, it was some sort of a mistake by someone that got you into the situation. Uh, not necessarily a culpable, culpable mistake, but simply a failure to realize that this human being had gone feral and was prepared to take your life. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, what happens in a gunfight situation? Uh, First of all, from a physical sense, what's the best way to approach it? Now, obviously, like you said, you're in the wrong place at the wrong time or you haven't evaluated the situation correctly. Uh, but here you are in a situation and um, all of a sudden there's a gun pointed at you. Okay, well, first, uh, understand the physio-psychological phenomena that may occur. Uh, these are distinct from psychophysiological phenomena in that something psychophysiological would begin in the mind and manifest itself in the body, a, a stress-induced ulcer, for example. Uh, 